What are they doing today? How was the exam? Did I hear good, good, good? Is that what I heard? It was... Wow, all right. We'll see if numbers bear that out. <laughs> Comments or questions or? The extra you like the extra credit question? <laughs> I thought you might like the extra credit question. <laughs> No comments on the exam? Uh, the exam, as I said last time, will not be available until Monday. I apologize, but the TAs are just too busy with exams this week themselves to do that. So um, I fully intend to make it available Monday morning, first thing. And um, I uh, have told the TAs that I expect that that's how they're going to spend their Thanksgiving break. So not everybody has it as, has it as bad as they do, I guess. Uh, but that, yeah, so you will have it back on Monday. Um, I will put a note out when it's available, as I always do, uh, but uh, it'll be available in the DB office as before. Okay? So extra points if it comes back with cranberry sauce on it? Extra points gets what? If it comes back with cranberry sauce all over it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I may see cranberry sauce on, on the, 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 the turn-ins. I don't know. So you, might, you guys may see them as you pick them up. So. Um, all right. Uh, actually, that reminds me. I always invite my classes over to my house. So if you guys are in town on Thursday, and you would like to come over for turkey, seriously, uh, give me a holler. I would be uh, happy to have you over. So uh, if you're not going home and you have no other plans, give me a holler. And I'll try not to food poison you with uh, turkey or something, right? <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. I usually get one or two people who take me up on it. So uh, we have uh, usually a big get-together of students and faculty at our house. So that'd be kind of fun. OK. Um, well, I guess without any comments for exams, we'll move forward. Uh, we are nearing the end, believe it or not. After today, there are only four lectures left in the term. Where did our term go, right? It's hard to believe. Yeah. After today, there's... Are you upset? Yes. Let's, we're going to need some counseling on the front row here, I think. So, uh, Try not to take it too hard, but I can promise you we'll have more of it next term. So... Uh, uh, I guess we're going to have class in here next term as well. Uh, they, they originally, we used to have it in Gilfillan, but they decided to give us the cl this classroom again, so we'll have to bear with it. I like this classroom, though, now. What's that? 451, yes. And but I've had a couple questions. 451 does not have a recitation. Where's the recitation? Where's the recitation? There's no recitation in 451 because we don't uh, work through problems like we do in um, 450. So there's no calculations as such in 451. Uh, the first half of 451 is that of um, uh, metabolism, the kind of things that we're doing right now. And the last half is on molecular biology, DNA synthesis, RNA synthesis, protein synthesis, gene expression. And uh, one brief thing on sensory, um, the, the senses, and one on um, the immune system. So um, that's what's there. The last thing I'll say is um, I will uh, tell you that uh, for the final exam, uh, I allow you to have a note card. Um, and I'm kind of picky on that note card. So you have to get the note card from me, and you have to turn it in with your final exam. That's the two rules about the note card. You have to, and if you, even if you don't want a note card, you have to turn in a note card that you get from me. Okay? So not having a note card is going to cost you points. Having a note card besides the one that I give you is going to cost you points as well. So make sure you get a note card from me. I'll make those available next week. Okay, And it's a fairly large note card. And yes, you can use both sides and so on and so forth. The primary rule being that everything on the note card must be in your own handwriting. You cannot paste figures on there. You cannot print on there. Uh, you have to use it as it is. Okay, um, And I, I had to institute that rule. I told the story to a few of you, I think. But I had to institute the rule a few years ago when I had a young man who had the really brilliant idea that if he printed the note card in red, and then printed over it in green, okay, that he used red-green glasses, he would double the capacity of his card. And it worked! It worked! Yeah, it was a clever idea, okay? So I said, well, maybe that's just taking a little too far. And I honestly think that there's some benefit from writing its things with your own hand anyway. So that's, that's the rule. So it has to be in your own handwriting. No printed cards, no copy and paste, no figures pasted on there. The card has to be as it is. And I'll say more about that um, when I have, hand the cards out on Monday. Yeah. OK. Last, the final exam in here is on uh, Monday, 
at 9.30 a.m. It's the first day, and it's one of the first finals. I've never had that happen with this class before. So we'll actually have that uh, final fair, done with fairly early. Okay? So that's good news, maybe bad news. I don't know. Okay. So uh, last time I talked about um, sh people, a lot of talking. When you're talking, it's hard for people around you to hear. Um, last time I talked about my own Kevin Ahern's pet theory about why Americans are getting obese, uh, and I hope that I uh, made a reasonable case for you about why that's the case. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is something that's going to reinforce something else I've been saying during the term, and probably you never thought about it that way either. And I've been telling you all along that glucose is a poison. And in general, sugars are poisons for cells. Okay? General sugars are poisons for cells. This next example I'm going to give you, you're going to see how it actually, this, this poison can manifest itself. Before I tell you about that, though, I have to tell you a little bit about how galactose is normally metabolized. So galactose is a uh, sugar. It's a monosaccharide. It's very closely related to glucose. It's actually an epimer of glucose. And uh, that epimer of glucose um, we get in our body by uh, drinking uh, dairy products. So uh, galactose, as I mentioned previously, is uh, half of the disaccharide. Uh, galactose is half of the disaccharide known as lactose, the other half being glucose. And our body has to deal with galactose because like glucose, galactose is a poison. And if we don't deal with it, we've got problems. Well, in our body, we deal with glucose being a poison by making glycogen. Question? I said galact. I'm sorry. If I said lactose, I meant galactose is an epimer of glucose. Galactose is an epimer of glucose. Okay. Um, galactose we have to deal with. Well, we don't make polymers of galactose. That's one of the things we don't do. All right. So let's look to see first how galactose is normally metabolized in our bodies. Galactose um, is first converted from the free sugar form to galactose one phosphate by this enzyme uh, known as galactokinase. Excuse me. And galactokinase uh, catalyzes the reaction here. It's rather similar to the reaction that you saw with hexokinase, the difference being that it's working with the galactose. And it's putting the phosphate on position 1 instead of putting it on position 6. But uh, pretty much everything else is the same. OK, so this is the first step that we have in detoxifying galactose. Well, it would be nice to be able to use galactose for um, uh, energy and so forth. And it turns out that I mentioned last time that glycolysis is a very useful pathway because it allows us to metabolize many sugars. And one of the ways that that happens is that these sugars can get converted into fructose or more commonly into glucose. And that's what we see happening on this figure. Now, I'm going to step you through this figure and um, try to hopefully uh, ease some of the confusion or concerns that students have about what's happening in this process. It's not nearly as complicated as it looks. And how many times have I told you that this term? You're never going to believe me again, right? So uh, here's our product of the last reaction, galactose 1-phosphate. All right? Galactose 1-phosphate plus UDP glucose. Okay, So that's just glucose linked to a UDP. And we'll see that molecule is important in glycogen metabolism later. But if I take these two and I combine them with this enzyme, whose name I'm not even going to mention, just simply because it's not really important for our purposes, what happens? Well, I see that the glucose gets released okay, as glucose 1-phosphate. And the galactose becomes linked to the UDP. So instead of having UDP glucose, I have UDP galactose. And I have some glucose 1-phosphate. All right, everybody see what's happened there so far? So we just swapped the glucose, uh, I'm sorry, the galactose 1-phosphate for a glucose 1-phosphate. And we're left with UDP galactose. <clears throat> now, glucose 1-phosphate, as we will talk about next week, is readily converted into glucose 6-phosphate. There's an enzyme that's known as phosphoglucomutase that will convert glucose 1-phosphate into glucose 6-phosphate. And of course, you know glucose 6-phosphate can get burned in glycolysis. So, Already we see how this pathway is contributing things that can be used in glycolysis. But we're not done yet because we have to convert UDP galactose into something useful, right? 
All we've done so far is just put the galactose onto a UDP. That comes up with the next reaction here, UDP galactose 4 epimerase. Well, that last enzyme name should tell you something about what's going on here. An epimerase is going to make an epimer. And galactose is an epimer of glucose. And guess what it does? It converts UDP galactose into UDP glucose. So now, we're right back where we started. So in essence, every time this wheel turns, all right, we're seeing a little wheel turning here. Every time this wheel turns, a glucose 1-phosphate is kicked out. So in essence, we're bringing in galactose and we're kicking out glucose. Galactose 1-phosphate kicking out glucose 1-phosphate. All right? So this pathway that you see on the screen is allowing us to metabolize lactose, I'm sorry, galactose in glycolysis. Now there's always confusion it's ha what's happening here, so I'll stop and take questions on that. Yes, Connie. Do you know how um, glucose 1 phosphate is used in glycolysis? So glucose 1-phosphate is not used in glycolysis, but glucose 1-phosphate can be converted readily into glucose 6-phosphate that is used in glycolysis. Oh. Okay? So we'll talk about the enzyme that does that next week. It's involved in glycogen metabolism, actually. But this is only one step away from glycolysis, basically. Yes, sir? Is there a beta form of glucose 1-phosphate? Is there a beta form of glucose 1-phosphate? Uh, there probably is, but the product here is an alpha. Yeah. So enzymes are always specific for what they will make. So in this case, you're only going to get the alpha uh, out of this guy. That's it? Was it that clear, or were you guys that much asleep? Yes, sir? Just as I was bothering me, would it be glucose 1 phosphate? phosphate I, would, it be, would it be a mutase? Change that from 1 to 6? So, uh, yeah, you're, the, the enzyme that will convert that from 1 to 6 is a mutase, and, I'll, and again, I'll talk about that next week. Just, yeah, so uh, it's, it's, it's a good question, but it is, it is actually a mutase that does that. And when I say mutase, what comes to mind? What's the intermediate? Glucose one six bisphosphate, right? Okay, <laughs> not two three bisphosphoglycerate. Not not every intermediate is two three BPG. Shannon. Uh, so I think I don't know if you said this before, but what's the difference between a mutase and isomerase? What's the difference between a mutase and isomerase? Okay, isomerase simply does the rearrangement by moving one piece to another piece. A mutase has an intermediate where we add and then we subtract, right? So in the case of two three BPG, we started with three PG. Then we had 2,3-BPG, and then we took off the phosphate to make 2-PG. In this case, you guys are getting ahead of me, but I'll, since you've asked the question, I'll ask. In this case, we have glucose 1-phosphate. The mutase puts a phosphate on, so we have glucose 1,6-bisphosphate. And then it takes off position 1, and we're left with glucose 6-phosphate. So the mutase, the name mutase will always tell you it's putting both of them on in the, in the process of doing what it does. Okay? All right. So this is a very useful pathway. It's a very important pathway for us because it allows us to metabolize galactose if we are, like most of us are, fairly uh, or relatively um, uh, enriched. Our diets are relatively enriched in dairy products. We're getting plenty of lactose. And if we don't have a way of metabolizing that galactose, we've got a problem. And that comes up next. So if we have, for example, a genetic problem where we are lacking either of these enzymes, galactose 1-phosphate uridyl transferase, whose name I don't expect you to know, or UDP galactose 4 <laughs> epimerase, if we're lacking either one of these enzymes, we can't do this cycle. Well, if we can't do this cycle, what's going to happen? Galactose 1-phosphate is going to accumulate. And when galactose 1-phosphate accumulates, then as this accumulates, so too is free galactose going to accumulate. Now, free galactose is the problem, as I said. It's a poison. When it accumulates, one of the problems that we experience is a product of this reaction. Our body recognizes, or our cells recognize, that galactose is a poison, so it does something to convert it into something that's less poisonous. And what it does is it reduces the aldehyde to an, aldehyde, to an alcohol to make galactitol. If you recall, aldehydes are fairly reactive. So this is a way of making this molecule much less reactive. It's a protective mechanism. Unfortunately, certain places in our body, this guy is a problem. And it turns out that in the lens of our eye, 
This will form crystals. Galactitol will form crystals in the lens of our eye and can lead to the formation of cataracts. It's not the only cause of cataracts, but it's a potential cause of cataracts. So if you're not metabolizing galactose properly, you make this compound here that becomes a crystal in the lens of your eye. Okay, so again, reinforcing the poison nature of galactose. Yes? Yes. Are people who are lactose intolerant lacking these enzymes? Turns out, no. Okay, so that's you're, you're, you're anticipating my next thing, uh, which I'll talk about in just a second. But lactose intolerance involves something else and other problems. But so, do people with diabetes get cataracts? Do people with diabetes get cataracts? People with diabetes get a lot of things, but I'm not aware of them getting cataracts at any higher level than anybody else. No. I always tell the story at this point, actually. Uh, that, because I watch young people do some things that are really stupid, all right? That's, that's my capacity as advisor is, uh, or instructor is I see people do things stupid. So there's one that people do that's stupid that they don't realize it's stupid. And I'll tell you about it because when I was your age, I did the same thing, all right? How many of you have ever popped something in the microwave and gone and just watched that little poppy cook in there, right? You done this? You want to do something really fun? Take an egg, Okay. Have you done this? You take the egg, you put it in the microwave, and all of a sudden, at some point, it goes kapoof! <laughs> you know, it goes, yeah, all right? Now, I'll tell you a statistic that'll surprise you. One of the greatest incidences of cataracts happens among people who work in the fast food industry. Do you know that? You know why? The thinking is that because of all the microwaves that are used in food prep, but they're getting exposed to microwaves, and that's causing some crystals of some sort to form in their eye and leading to cataracts. All right? You should reduce your exposure to microwaves. Just because it's got a screen on there doesn't mean that there aren't microwaves that are coming out there. Okay? And yes, cell phones use microwaves too. Whatever you do with microwaves, you should be reducing your exposure to them, not increasing them. So don't go press the eyeball up against the microwave oven watching that thing happen. When I use the microwave at home, I usually stay at least six to eight feet away from it at all times. Seriously. Okay. Yeah. Whoa, look at Kevin. He's over there, right? But, uh, but seriously, okay. Why should you increase your exposure to it? Just like I wouldn't go and expose myself to x-rays any more than I would need to. I wouldn't uh, expose myself to microwaves any more than I need to either. Okay. All right. Um, last thing on lactose. The question about lactose intolerance always comes up at this point, and uh, you guys are on top of this as well. Lactose intolerance arises from a different problem. Lactose intolerance arises because we lack the enzyme, or I shouldn't say we lack, our body changes over time the amount of the enzyme called lactase that it synthesizes. Okay? When we're young, when we're an infant, we're drinking milk, we need a lot of lactase because that's the primary um, uh, source of sugars and so forth that we're getting in our diets, coming through the milk. All right? Over evolutionary time, okay, what's happened is we look at, at, at animals drinking milk or we look at humans drinking milk. Uh, over evolutionary time, the only times that really we needed to make that enzyme is during that infant stage. Okay? As humankind has developed organized farming and we've had availability of dairy products and so on and so forth, we have tended to eat those dairy products longer in our lives. And while our body does continue to make some lactase as we get older, it varies considerably from one culture to another, in term, or one ethnic group to another in terms of how much lactase is made. If you don't make sufficient lactase, what will happen is you're left with lactose. You don't break it down into glucose and galactose. And as a consequence, lactose is metabolized by bacteria in your stomach in a different way than these guys are, which get dumped into your bloodstream. So the bacteria get a hold of this guy, and they go crazy. And of course, one of the byproducts of metabolic action is carbon dioxide. Well, gas, some severe problems relating to discomfort and so forth happen as a result of a deficiency of lactase. And it's happening because, again, as we're getting older, we're making less of that enzyme. So there are commercial versions of lactase that are available for people who are what are called lactose intolerant, that they can actually just simply swallow when they have dairy products 
can help to relieve uh, that problem. Okay. Other question? Uh, comments? Yes. So what happens to people who are like deathly lactose Like they can't stand the smell of cheese, it just makes them feel bad. What happens to people who are, what she says, deathly lactose intolerant? I never heard of such a thing, uh, so I don't know about that. Um, a lot of people have either mental notions of, of problems, or there's other things that may relate. So people who have issues with gluten intolerance and so forth sometimes are diagnosed mistakenly with lactose intolerance, and that may be a problem. But I don't have anybody deathly um, um, afflicted with lactose intolerance. Do you? Yes. Yeah. You do? It may be, an, again, it could be an allergy or something else. It's not directly lactose intolerance. Yeah. Lactose intolerance mostly comes about as a result of the discomfort, the most, the most common thing that's happening is the discomfort that's there. Yeah. I guess that leads on, is that related to some form to like celiac disease? So celiac disease is related to um, actually uh, gluten intolerance. Yes. Uh, and there are some connections, although they're distinct diseases, but there are some connections between those two. Yeah. But again, lactose intolerance, different area, different area. I had a student who was diagnosed <clears throat> with... Uh, Originally diagnosed with lactose intolerance, and then she just, you know, got the paranoia. I'm, I'm absolutely not going to have anything. I can't be around milk and so on and so forth. And uh, discovered that it wasn't lactose that she was intolerant to. It actually was, she was exquisitely sensitive to gluten and was getting that in a variety of ways. And she was actually getting, she could actually get gluten through milk, yeah, that the cow was eating. Yeah, so she was, she was very sensitive. So when they got that diagnosed, they realized what it was, it was causing her problem. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's, all right. So now we've talked about the metabolism of the sugars. We've talked about how glucose gets broken down. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about regulation of the pathway. And then when we come back on uh, Wednesday, and I know you all are going to be here on Wednesday. When we come back on, you're not all going to be here on Wednesday? Uh, I know I'll be here on Wednesday. Uh, <laughs> When we come back on Wednesday, I will then talk about regulation again in view of gluconeogenesis. So we're going to get sort of a cursory look at the regulation of glycolysis, and then on Wednesday we'll see how that ties to the regulation of the synthesis of glucose as well. And the two are actually um, coordinated. Let's start talking first about a really, really interesting enzyme. <coughs> Excuse me. That... Um, as I said before, is the most important regulatory enzyme that we see in glycolysis. This is the enzyme phosphofructokinase, or as you probably memorized it, PFK. PFK um, is a um, uh, molecule that has a, is, I'm sorry, it's an enzyme that has a very um, uh, interesting uh, structure. You see it is actually existing here as a tetramer. And uh, that enzyme... Um, has a very unusual behavior, all right? Well, let's take a look at this figure. What we see is we're plotting on the y-axis the velocity of the reaction that it catalyzes. Now, you may not remember the reaction, so I will tell you. The reaction that PFK catalyzes is as follows. Fructose 6-phosphate plus ATP makes fructose 1,6-bisphosphate plus ADP. So it's using the energy of ATP to put the phosphate onto fructose 6-phosphate to make fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Okay, simple enough, right? If we do this reaction and we're plotting V versus S, where the substrate that we're using is fructose 6-phosphate, we see something very odd happening. Now, this is one of the few enzymes I know that behaves in this way. You might say, what's so unusual? We look at this, we say, okay, so it's got sigmoidal nature. There's a sort of an S shape there. And in the presence of ATP, it's sigmoidal. So ATP is an allosteric effector, right? Well, ATP is a substrate, kind of like we saw with ATCase, right? When aspartate affected the enzyme, right? Very similar. However, if we do the same reaction with a, a small amount of ATP, Look how much the velocity goes up. Now remember, ATP is a substrate. How do we increase the velocity by decreasing the amount of a substrate? We haven't seen that happen before. So the enzyme is getting turned on by having a less amount of one of its substrates. 
That's very odd. How, how would that manifest itself? Any thoughts? Yes, sir. Possibly the concentration less important than the effect of feedback inhibition from high ATP concentration? So he says possibly the uh, effect of concentration is less important than the feedback inhibition resulting from ATP concentration. Well, yes, that's true, but that doesn't tell us how that can happen. You're right. Yes? Possibly like Gibbs equation. Like what? Does that do the Gibbs free energy? Does that do the Gibbs free energy? No. Remember that enzymes never change the overall Gibbs free energy. So it, that, that's not it. Yes? Okay, how many sites does the enzyme have? So the enzyme has, uh, it's, a, it's a tetramer, so there are four different subunits that are there. Well, you're getting there, you're getting there. She says the other subunits to be available for little ATP was there. Are there two sites to bind for ATP? Ah, over here, okay. He's hit it on the nose. It turns out the enzyme has two places to bind ATP. One is an allosteric site, and one is a catalytic site. Which one do you suppose has the higher KM? Which one is the enzyme going to have greater affinity for? Allosteric. <laughs> you two want to duke it out? <laughs> Let's think about this. When we have low amounts of ATP, the enzyme is more active. What does that tell us? Something. So ATP is inhibiting the enzyme, right? We all agree on that, right? That's what we see here. ATP is inhibiting the enzyme in some way. It's allosterically regulated. So I'm asking you, does the allosteric site have a higher affinity, or does the catalytic site have a higher affinity? The catalytic site's got to have a higher affinity, right? Because only when the ATP concentration is high does it start banging into the allosteric site and turning it off. Okay? That's a really cool enzyme. Very cool enzyme. Okay? So, yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's responding to two signals. Now, this turns out to be really important because, well, why do we want the enzyme turned off if there's high ATP? Well, think about it. Do we want to be burning gasoline? Do we want to be burning our furnace when it's summer? No. When we have plenty of energy, do we want to be burning our glucose? No, we don't. And we have plenty of energy when we have high ATP. High ATP should be turning this enzyme off, and that's basically what we're seeing. It's turning the enzyme, it's turning the volume of that enzyme down. That's really important. On the other hand, what happens if we don't have much ATP? Well, you betcha we want this enzyme going because we want to burn glucose so that we can get pyruvate and we can get ATP and we can get the citric acid cycle and we can get all these things going. Low ATP is turning that enzyme on. Really cool. It's a very cool thing. Okay. Now, phosphofructokinase turns out to be affected by several things, as we shall see. PFK gets affected by several allosteric effectors. One of them is ATP. Another very important one is this molecule called F26BP, which stands for fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. <coughs> now, one of the things you're going to see as we talk about the regulation of the metabolic pathways relating to sugars is many of the names are going to sound similar. Fructose 2,6-bisphosphate sounds an awful lot like fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Because the numbers ain't equal, you know that ain't the same thing. Right? You're going to have to spend some time getting straight numbers and names. And you're going to see enzyme names are going to overlap with these as well. For the moment, we're going to focus simply on this enzyme, on, on this molecule, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Okay? Look what happens with this molecule. Relative velocity, and we're doing the same plot that we did before. Here's the enzyme uh, with no fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Here's the enzyme in the presence of 0.1 micromolar. That's a very, very tiny amount. Here's the enzyme in the presence of 1 micromolar. Look at that. Bang! It's on. Fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is present in very vanishingly tiny quantities in our cell. Such vanishingly tiny quantities, it wasn't even discovered until like the 1980s. But in very tiny amounts, it turns this enzyme on superbly. Yes, sir? Uh, 
Should the x-axis also be labeled F260P instead of F6P? No. This is a substrate. No. Okay. This is an allosteric effector. Gotcha. Right. Okay. Now, very, very sensitive switch to turn that enzyme on. If we do the same plot and instead of measuring the substrate fructose 6 phosphate, we measure with ATP. We know ATP's got some weird relation with this enzyme, right? We see that this activates the enzyme even in higher concentrations of ATP. In other words, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is a more important regulator than ATP itself is. Cells use fructose 2,6-bisphosphate as a way of controlling this enzyme at very, very, very sensitive levels. And we will see next week when I talk about glycogen metabolism how this ties in to all of this. Okay? It's a master picture that we think about with respect to sugar metabolism that is a really interesting and elaborate control. But fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is probably the most important regulator of this enzyme. Now, the synthesis of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is a little complicated, and I'm going to save that until I talk about gluconeogenesis. But suffice it to say, cells have interesting ways of making this molecule, and it doesn't take very much to get glycolysis going. For those of you who wonder about structure, there's the structure of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. And we look at this, and we remind ourselves as I had to myself this morning when I looked at this, that we always want to number our carbons. That'll help us keep track of things. Carbon 1, 2, I'm sorry, carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That's carbon 2 with a phosphate on it right there. Okay. Now, um, I've described situations to you where we have muscle and we have liver and we have to think about the different conditions that the body has to uh, respond to relative uh, to those um, um, situations that much muscle and liver find themselves in. Okay? This schematically shows us the overall pathway of glycolysis. I told you that there are three enzymes that play important regulatory roles. The first is hexokinase. And as I said, its regulation is a little odd. Its product actually helps to, to turn it off. Okay? That's not totally surprising. It's known as substrate level regulation. Uh, but that uh, product affects this enzyme, hexokinase. So hexokinase is the first regulated enzyme. PFK is the second regulated enzyme. And we see, for example, that ATP can turn it off. This is a little confusing. AMP can actually turn it on. That makes sense. AMP is an indicator of low energy inside of cells. Low energy, you want to turn this enzyme on. We also see that um, ATP, of course, as I mentioned earlier, turns this enzyme off. Fructose 2,6-bisphosphate turns the enzyme on. Now, pyruvate kinase um, is the third regulated enzyme. And I'm going to show you something about that enzyme in a minute. But I want to sort of remind you of something that I talked about um, earlier, uh, but I haven't had a chance to finish the story on. Okay? Pyruvate kinase is regulated, there goes our bouncing ball, pyruvate kinase is regulated in two ways. One, by uh, phosphorylation. Phosphorylation tends to turn it down or turn it off. The other is by allosteric regulation. And the allosteric regulation involved in controlling pyruvate kinase is fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Fructose 1,6-bisphosphate will activate that enzyme. It activates that enzyme. And it activates that enzyme in a mechanism I refer to as feed-forward activation. Feed-forward. That's the opposite of feedback inhibition. Feedback inhibition said that the last molecule turned off the first enzyme in the pathway. Feed-forward activation says a molecule in the pathway turns on an enzyme further ahead. Now, let's think about how this actually works in our body, because it's kind of cool. All right? Let's imagine that we are um, sitting here, and all of a sudden, the fire alarm goes off. I've actually had this happen in this class. The fire alarm goes off, and we have to all go racing outside. Right? When that happens, okay, the first thing that we have to do is we have to 
get out. We have to maybe we, we had to run a long ways, not in this building, but we had to run a long ways to get out. We need energy to get out, right? What's going to happen? Well, if I'm sitting here resting, what's happening with my pyruvate kinase reaction? Very little. It's not doing much. I'm not burning energy. I'm not going through glycolysis much. Things are just kind of sitting there doing their thing, right? However, when I get up and I start running, my body starts through epinephrine dumping glucose into my bloodstream. My muscles take up that glucose. And now their glucose concentration is high. What's going to happen with glycolysis? It's going to start. Okay? Great. Glycolysis starts. Glucose goes to glucose 6-phosphate. Glucose 6-phosphate goes to fructose 6-phosphate. Fructose 6-phosphate goes to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And then we hit a wall. Anybody remember what the wall is? There was one enzyme that had a high positive delta G. Aldolase. Aldolase is a wall. We've got a high positive delta G0 prime at the aldolase, and all of a sudden, what starts accumulating? The substrate for aldolase. Look what it is. Fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. As fructose 1,6-bisphosphate accumulates, trying to get over that energy hump, what do you suppose it's going to do? It's going to start binding to pyruvate kinase. And what's pyruvate kinase going to do? Well, it's going to take whatever phosphoenyl pyruvate that's there and convert it into pyruvate. Now, because there's none of this, there was less of this, this reaction goes forwards. This reaction goes forwards. This reaction goes forwards. And finally, we've decreased the product of the aldolase reaction, which is glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and, one, and, and 3 phosphate, glyceraldehyde 3, DHAP and G3P. Okay? <laughs> that bell. We've decreased the products of the aldolase reaction. We've increased the reactants. We've decreased the products. And that's how we get over the energy hump. Feed-forward activation is important for helping us to get over that aldolase barrier. So this occurs in a, the phenomenon I think I've talked about previously called pushing and pulling a reaction. We push a reaction when we increase substrate. We pull a reaction when we decrease product. The feed-forward activation is decreasing product. That's what it's ultimately doing. And as a result of that, this now goes all the way down to pyruvate, and we start making those ATPs we need to run away. Is what? The pull part is decreasing the product. That's right. So if we wanted to get our automobile out of the street, if we had us pushing it, that's one thing. But if there's only one or two of us pushing it, that's not so good. But if we had somebody on the other side with a truck and a cable pulling the car and us pushing at the same time, it's much more likely to move. Same thing occurs with reactions. OK, questions about that? OK, let's go and take one quick look at pyruvate. Let's see, I think, yeah, let's not mess with that. Talk about pyruvate kinase. Pyruvate kinase is the last enzyme in the glycolysis pathway. As I said, it's catalyzing the Big Bang. The Big Bang. So we want to have this enzyme under control, because if we don't, as soon as we have PEP, it's going to be going straight to pyruvate. Well, one of the ways that we uh, regulate this enzyme is with phosphorylation. Phosphorylation occurs as a result of action of our friend, protein kinase A. Protein kinase A will catalyze the addition of a phosphate to pyruvate kinase and cause it to become into the less active state. Okay? Pyruvate kinase is also regulated allosterically. Okay? It's regulated by alanine for one. Alanine. Alanine is an amino acid. Why is alanine important? Well, alanine is actually a good measure of pyruvate because pyruvate is readily converted into alanine. When we have high alanine, we have high pyruvate, we don't want this enzyme working. We will actually allosterically turn this enzyme off with alanine. Okay? ATP will also turn this enzyme off. We have too much ATP, 
what's going to happen? Well, we don't want to keep dumping more and more of this stuff. We're going to stop making pyruvate, and we're going to clog up the enzyme. The allosteric activator, of course, as I said earlier, is fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So we can turn the enzyme off. We can turn the enzyme on allosterically and by phosphorylation and, of course, dephosphorylation to turn it on. Now, this theme of allosteric regulation superimposed on covalent modification is one that we will see a lot of in glycogen metabolism. Okay? So this is a little complicated, all right? but the important thing is understanding what all the pieces are, not how they all play together. What if I have a phosphorylated enzyme and I have fructose 1,6-bisphosphate? Okay. Well, it's kind of hard to mentally balance all that. I'm not going to go through and do that. But I do think that you should know the effects that phosphorylation has. You should know the effect that fructose 1,6-bisphosphate has. And you should know the effects that ATP have on this enzyme. These ATP and alanine are offs. And phosphorylation. And phosphorylation too, yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's a lot of stuff with regulation there. Um, let's see. I want to say um, a little bit about gluts. We talked about gluts earlier. Um, you may not remember, but when I talked about the insulin signaling pathway, I told you that the way that the body deals with high blood glucose is by synthesizing insulin. Insulin went through that multi-step pathway that involved the Hulk that you recall, right? And the end result of the insulin signaling pathway, at least one of the end results, was that the movement of glut proteins from the cytoplasm to the cell membrane was affected. It favored the movement of those gluts, and the gluts stand for glucose transport proteins. There are many different glu gluts, as you can see uh, on the screen, okay? And they're located in various places uh, in our body. These gluts turn out to play some very important roles from a human health perspective, and they may have some very, very important considerations with respect to treating cancer, okay? So with that introduction, I want to tell you about a very interesting phenomenon. Okay. We think of the, the development of a tumor. As many of you have noted in here, there's a multi-step process it takes to get to being a tumor. And that multi-step process is probably different for every different tumor that forms. There's no one way of making a tumor. There are many ways of making a tumor, but there's no one single step that gives us to a tumor. What people have noted about tumors uh, is the following, that tumors uh, do tend to grow more rapidly than do other cells. Tumor cells tend to grow more rapidly. They are not organized. They grow as a clump. And so what happens is the needs and demands of a tumor cell are greater than those of a non-tumor cell. What happens in the process of that is really interesting and cool. Okay? It turns out that tumors, because they are just growing in a place, they don't have good access to blood supply normally. One of the things that tumor cells probably have to do in order to survive is they have to stimulate the growth of blood vessels to supply them with blood. There's a protein known as angiogenin that stimulates the growth of blood vessels. And many tumors will, in fact, activate or synthesize or accumulate angiogenin and favor the growth of blood vessels to supply them with blood. Yes, sir? Is the angiogenin a direct result of VEGF? I do not know. Don't know. Because that's one thing we went over in cell biology, the vascular endothelial mm -hmm. growth factor mm -hmm. that leads to this. Yeah. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I, I can look it up for you, though. Okay. Now, angiogenin, all right, is favoring the growth of blood vessels supplying tumors with blood. <coughs> blood contains glucose, blood contains oxygen, all the things that tumor cells or any cell would like to have. One strategy for treating tumors is to inhibit the growth of the blood vessels. And there are some promising drugs that appear to do very well at basically starving tumors to death. That's kind of cool. Okay? Now, what is interesting is, well, if this tumor, as, as it's growing, right, it takes a while to get these things synthesized. It takes a while to get these blood vessels there. 
as it's growing, if this tumor cell is growing faster than its surrounding tissues, what's its, great, its energy needs are greater. There's not a blood supply. There's not an oxygen supply. These tumor cells are going to be what we call hypoxic. They're going to be low in oxygen. I've already told you oxygen is necessary for rapidly metabolizing cells. We think of this tumor cell as a rapidly metabolizing cell. It's taking up oxygen. It's taking up oxygen faster than it's getting it from the environment in which it finds itself. Okay? Gesundheit. All right? Now, hypoxia is a normal phenomenon. Our body goes through hypoxia all the time. Our body has a response to hypoxia. When we, make, when we are hypoxic, we make a protein called hypoxia induction factor. It's a protein. Okay? It's a protein that is a transcription factor. A transcription factor activates transcription of certain genes. I want you to look at the genes <laughs> that hypoxia inducing or inducible factor, induction factor is what I call it, makes. Look at this. It's making gluts. It's making hexokinase. It's making phosphofructokinase, that's PFK. It's making aldolase. It's making, look at all these enzymes of glycolysis. This makes a lot of sense. Let's think about what we've learned about glycolysis. Okay? I told you that when we had plenty of oxygen, we produced a heck of a lot more ATP, right? When we don't have plenty of oxygen, we've got to burn more glucose to get the same amount of ATP. These hypoxic cells are recognizing that. They're making more glycolysis enzymes so they can take in more sugar so they can keep that cell alive. Okay? What you know about glycolysis says this makes perfect sense. And it also means maybe I've got a strategy for how I might stop a tumor from growing. If I can find ways to starve it to death by perhaps stopping this transcriptional activity, affecting any of these enzymes preferentially in tumor cells, I got a very cool way to knock out cancer. Okay? All right, almost at the end, any questions about what I've just told you? Uh, question, yeah. A malignant tumor is growing uncontrollably. It will metastasize and kill you. A benign tumor uh, is growing controllably. Other questions? With another hand back there? Okay, so I'll see all of you on Wednesday, I know. All right. Uh, I'm not planning to be here. I'm not planning to be here. How you doing, Liz? Can I be lecture Wednesday? Yeah, in fact, you can come take notes for me if you want to. Oh, wow. I know you're bribing me or something here. <laughs> I have a question about the phosphofructokinase being phosphorylated. Okay. Doesn't the SF1 pathway phosphorylate protein kinase A back in the You're talking about phosphorylation of protein, uh, uh, pyruvate kinase or PFK? PFK doesn't get phosphorylated. No. What is that last one that you showed then? That was pyruvate kinase. Pyruvate kinase. Oh, okay. Right. I got confused. Yeah. So it gets even more confusing because it turns out that there's an enzyme called PFK2, and that's what makes P of F2, 2,6-BP. Okay. And it gets phosphorylated. So you can okay. save, save your confusion for that. Yeah. Ah. This is the most inconvenient place. It is, but that's just the way that I am. An inconvenient kind of a guy. An inconvenient truth, I believe, is what we call it, right? Yeah.